am Catherine. I am the Education Event Coordinator here at Noman. Um, first off, I want to thank you for joining us today at the Lenovo stage at Noman School in Hollywood for our Anatomy Lab, the Art and Design of Quadrupeds event. Um, also, we are back on Twitch today, uh, so hi everyone joining us online. Um, we will be archiving this event on YouTube and Twitch after it ends, so be sure to look out for those if you want to recap on today's exciting sessions. Uh, today's event, as you can see, is sponsored by Lenovo. Big thanks to Lenovo, as always, for helping us bring these free educational events to you from Noman Campus. Um, another special thanks to uh, Wacom for the Cintiq and Intuos Pro setup on the stage today um, that our presenters will be working on. Perfect example, Andrea right here. Um, and we're very lucky to have such great support from our industry friends and partners. Uh, we also want to thank um, Etch Lab, Etcher Lab for providing Good. us with raffle Good. prizes this afternoon. Uh, we have two slates with a satchel and then a mini slate. Um, so make sure you hold on to your raffle tickets. And uh, don't worry if you don't win the raffle because we also Good. have a discount code for Etcher Lab Stay. outside at the check-in desk. Um, all right, so for our first half of the event, we have three incredible talents uh, lined up. Joining us first with our lovely Noman instructor, Andrea Adams. <laughs> um, and she will be live sketching our four-legged friends that you can see up here with the assistance of executive director at the Nature of Wild Works, Molly Hogan. Quick. Okay. <laughs> Oh. And then after that, we'll be welcoming award-winning taxidermist Alice Markham, who will be take, uh, talking about one of her recent projects in taxidermy. All right, so enough of me talking. Uh, let's welcome Andrea and Molly. Hey, guys. So um, whenever we do these uh, events, um, I just want everybody to make sure that they understand that live animals, as you guys can see, kind of do what they want. Um, and that means shenanigans are going to be happening relatively constantly. Um, oh. <laughs> Molly is going to talk to you guys a little bit about what's going on here, but obviously a fox is, oh. is not a dog. So part of the great um, challenge of doing live drawing, of course, um, is having to deal with that um, and just getting used to that whole process of, uh, you know, yes, you fire, <laughs> acknowledging that... Um, you have to sort of follow the animal instead of the animal doing what you say. And even that being said, Star 2 is not necessarily gonna, gonna do what, what I would want as, as a drawer. So that, that process is sort of mentally something you gotta come to terms with and use to, to your advantage um, when drawing live animals. Um, before I kind of start jibber jabbering, I'm gonna let Molly talk for a little because this is sort of the star situation of what's happening. Um, talk a little bit about her organization and, and who you see in front of you and, and their um, amazing outreach they do uh, all over, but also especially at Noman. You. The Nature of Wild Works yes. in Topanga. Um, so uh, my name is Molly, thank you, Andrea, and it's great to be here today. I'll be wrangling while speaking uh, with the fox and the dog that's very similar to a fox in wildness, in the wildness category. So this is Star and Fire and Patty. There you go. That's all Patty does. <laughs> and uh, she'll sit there and look cute. She does not like the fox, but Star loves the fox. And Star loves everyone. We'll play with anyone at any time. So we have about 50 animals at WildWorks. Um, the biggest thing is mountain lions, and the smallest, I think, are prairie dogs currently. We have a lot of birds of prey, raptors, that we bring to Andre's classes. And dogs and foxes are related, but they're not actually that closely related. So these guys were raised together, so that's why they like each other. Um, Fire actually has lots of inappropriate relationships, the fox. She walks up to the mountain lion cage wagging her tail, you know, saying hi, when it really wouldn't work out for them to be housed together. So she just loves everyone. And Star wants to play with her, and she does, is, <laughs> doesn't... <laughs> That looks sort of obscene, I realize, but that's actually a, a dominance behavior. Right. So, Fire pretty much knows, Star, that you're dominant over her. 
so you don't have to squish her. So Fire is 13 years old, and I've had her since she was a little tiny puppy, and she came from a fur farm. Oh. So she was going to be made into a fur coat. And uh, Star is six years old, and so she's, when I got her, rescued her, she just immediately fell in love with um, all the foxes that we have at Wildworks. So she's a good mom to the foxes. And she likes to perform, she loves people, so she comes to all the programs. And, uh, you know, foxes, they're so different in that they're dogs, you know, they're directly, direct descendants of wolves. And foxes are not. So a dog and a wolf can actually breed a dog and a coyote, a coyote and a wolf, they're all in the same family. But foxes are in their own family. In fact, a red fox can't even breed with a gray fox. So they're kind of, to me, kind of a half dog, half cat um, animal. They have slit pupils. If you shine a flashlight in her eyes, you'll see that she has slit pupils like a cat. And uh, they can see better at night. And they do not, as we discovered earlier, like riding in an air kennel like cats. So dogs are pretty easily trained to ride in one, but she goes, no, I want to come out and meet everybody. So um, Wildworks, just so you guys know, um, Wildworks comes to Noman um, every term for our animal drawing class, which I teach, which is super fun and awesome. Um, anybody who wants to get more practice doing this, it's a great, a great way to do it. Um, and Molly brings a whole van load of critters. Um, and I think some, there's just very like, critical experience that can be had from drawing animals from life. Um, the, the more you do that, it's just like with figure drawing, the more figure drawing classes you take where you're actually drawing a live human, um, the more animal studies you do, you can apply that work to other aspects of your work. Um, you know, it, what we're talking about today what um, Alice is going to talk about, what Stephen is going to talk about, and okay. especially what Crystal is going to talk about later, um, has to do with um, form and anatomy. And, and my sort of opinion about that as an illustrator and, and as a teacher of animal drawing is it's cool if you love animals, but you're like, well, I'm not ever going to like be a creature designer. I'm not ever going to like draw animals because I just don't do that. Um, but you can take what you learn about drawing animals and apply it to all other form studies. And that includes um, animation, that includes character animation, that includes um, hard surface constructs, textures, you name it, it sort of starts here organically, right? So the, the thing that's kind of fun about what we do, what we're doing here with these guys, um, and, and keeping it like really, really loose, this method is, is how I teach this class. Um, it's, it's the sort of method that I um, have always used, even though I was trained at Art Center to do a very like viscom structured style of illustration. But again, with live animals, that doesn't really work because it's really awesome that Star is like lying there very quietly right now. <laughs> but especially if you go to the zoo, there's no guarantee that the animal is gonna just be obedient to your drawing for the 45 minutes or whatever that you want to sit there and draw. So what you need to do is, um, in my opinion, um, is get used to, first of all, being okay with your drawing being a hot mess, um, with it being unconstructed, with it being gestural. And from there, what you're doing is you're going to sort of go with the flow with whatever happens with the animal. And if the animal decides to move, or like fire just did, um, you just go with it. And I feel that starting from a point of gesture, you're not ignoring the anatomy, you're embracing the anatomy for sure, but you're using your eye and you're seeing more than anything else so that at some other point in time, if you wanted, you could do a very like controlled, constructed image of the animal, right? So with quadrupeds, um, and we have three lovely red-headed examples here uh, <laughs> with true. quadrupeds. That's true. What we've got is a vertebrate, right? And you've got a shoulder girdle and a pelvic girdle and four legs that essentially hang straight down. We call that an erect animal, meaning that the limbs don't, it's not like Mr. Potato Head with the limbs going off the side. Imagine uh, an alligator, right? So an alligator moves like this because the limbs go into the side of the girdle, and a dog moves like this because the limbs go into the bottom. So an erect quadruped 
moves a particular way, right? And now that these guys are nice and quiet, we're like, everyone's like, thank God, I can actually draw them for five seconds. Um, but when they were moving around, you could see, and those of you who have dogs of your own, or you watch dogs, or whatever, um, you know that they have very particular She's ways of locomoting. And Stephen's going to talk more about that a little bit later, because um, he did a fantastic animation about that. Um, but basically, dogs are what we call digitigrade, and that means that they walk on their toes. So their limbs hang straight down, and they walk like this, right? So if you were looking at you know, the construct of a dog's foot, they're walking on this part, right? Um, they're not walking on this part. A, good girl. a human You're a good girl, walks on the whole bottom of the foot, right? That's called plantigrade, and you're actually stepping on your whole entire foot from heel to toe is going on the floor or the ground. And this is the foot of the dog, so it's been pushed up, right? And what that essentially means is, yes, you, best girl. If you guys can see um, from, from your vantage point or whatever, uh, if you can see like stars four paws, for example, um, they're, you know, they're shaped kind of like this, all right, as she's lying down. Right there, there's a bend. The hind limbs, for example, right, go like this. And there's a bend right here. So in drawing them by, of course, advice, first and foremost, is to look at what's in front of you. And don't assume that what you know in your head is the correct thing. Because even me, who's been drawing animals for decades, um, I tend to default to some lazy techniques sometimes, and then I'm like, oh, actually, that's not what that looks like. So, for example, I've done this sort of thing, where if I'm looking at the hind leg, and then I do that. And that's not actually what's happening. This doesn't exist. This does. That's the heel, or the calcaneus, the bone right here, right? And then those are the phalanges, or the toes, essentially. And this is the metatarsis. So I do this because I think, oh, the, the front leg has that sort of bend in it, right? Good and girl. if you Stay. look at the dogs, you can see that that's Stay. exactly true. So what you need to do is see, and that's why mm -hmm. watching the animals, even if they are moving around and being okay. a pain in your butt, and like not sitting still so you can do a lovely oil painting of them, it's better for your eye and for your wrist to have to chase them, essentially, right? So that you don't default to incorrect anatomy when you get down to the specifics of your drawings. Um, so the digitigrade animal uh, walking on their toes means that there is essentially a force dissemination that happens when the foot hits the ground. And that allows for like a spring loading to propel the animal forward. And quadrupeds, um, like bipeds, have multiple gates. And when a dog or a fox or a wolf walks, that foot hits the ground, right, like this. And then essentially the force is disseminated through that spring as the toes push the foot back up. So the spine of the dog, rather like the spine of a cat, is a little curvy, right? So, you know, when you guys saw Star, here she is. There's Star's back, right? And there's a bit of a curve to it. They have a nice flexible spine. So that when they run, for example, and again, Stephen will talk about this, you'll see this in the animation. Um, when they run, there is a hyperextension and a hyperflexion that happens that is propelled by this digitigrade action of the foot hitting the ground and pushing the animal forward or propelling the animal forward. So this is all the technical stuff that kind of comes out when you are gesturally drawing the animal and understanding that that hind leg, this is Fire's hind leg, she's got really long toes, longer than stars, which could mean a few things evolutionarily. My pen just got stuck. Um, it could mean speed, because the more surface area on the ground, 
the more there is to push off. Um, her limbs are much thinner. She's much smaller and more lightweight. So that also would contribute, right? Smaller, more agile, faster. Um, and like Molly was saying, uh, you know, the fox is not a dog. So dogs we've domesticated and bred to do very specific things. So Star's agility is going to be different than Fire's because you guys know Star's job. What is her job? What, what is her breed's job? Well, her personal job is to be my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the breed's uh, job, of course, is to herd, to herd sheep or cattle. Um, and the Papillon breed's dog uh, is actually to sit next to queens and kings. That's their job. It's a tough job, you know, but somebody's got to do it. And so anyway, Star um, does that at home. She'll herd the various animals. Um, she, we we uh, say that she herds foxes, which is pretty funny, and coyotes. So that's what they do. And uh, she's not really trained to herd sheep. She, her, her strong point as an individual is raising uh, any kind of animal and playing with it and getting it used to playing with a dog instead of playing with a person. And that's really good for a wild animal that's in a protected environment like wild works and has to travel places because you want them to have a companion that they're really close to um, and you also don't want them to play with you, to think that you're that that um, companion to jump all over you and, and things. You want them to play with the dog. So Fire here, she's been panting a little bit, you might notice, because she's an older animal and it's summer and she's wearing a fur coat. Aww. So, and you might notice that her fur coat is still shedding and they will shed throughout the summer and lose their whole undercoat, different than dogs. You know, dogs will shed, but they basically look the same in summer and winter. Um, but these guys, they lose their whole undercoat and she still hasn't even lost most of her tail, see? It's still just falling out here. And when the sun changes position and starts going down earlier, then she'll start growing her new winter fur coat. And she's about twice the size in her winter fur coat as she is now. But she's just kind of slow to shed this year for, you know, the weather's been very different as we know, so we're not sure why, but she's still got all this um, hair that you can see here. So she's probably a little warm at this point. But fire is I'm an exceptional individual. You know, for a wild animal to come out here and do this in front of people, it's a lot to ask. And she's been doing her job since she was four weeks old. That's when I acquired her. And she was just a little tiny fox puppy. But I want to mention that foxes do not make good pets. Okay, you can probably smell her from here. <laughs> yeah, they smell like skunks. So they really are very stinky for some reason. And you cannot housebreak them. And they shed like crazy all over everything. And normally they're not quite as sweet as fire. Fire has an exceptional dog-like personality, but wild animals always a wild animal. So you just really want to have a dog or a cat as a pet. A lot of the animals we have at Wildworks were confiscated pets because it's not legal in California to have them. So that's why we have, uh, have a lot of what fire, like I said, came from a fur farm. So she got to not be mated to a fur coat. But she still is a little warm today, I think. She's leaving a little bit of a fur coat here today. Yeah, she's Just, if anybody wants <laughs> she's to like, leaving one for all gather of you it all up and like one. felt it together yeah. to make something, you should knock yourself out. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's super important. You know, I think we all get like fooled by like, you guys know that super cute video that made the rounds of like, there was a fox in somebody's front yard and they left their dog toy out and the fox was like playing with it and it was like throwing itself in the air and rolling around <laughs> and then the dog was like watching through the... Um, the glass door or whatever and it's like oh I wish I had a fox it's so cute and this and that and it's like no it's it's stuff like that I think makes people think that they can um, I was reading about about wolves and similarly wolves um, cannot be uh, housebroken or trained they only seem like they can be until they decide for whatever reason that they don't want to be anymore um, which is why hybrids are also a really bad idea. Right, even though they people can't, think that they're a they good can't idea. be obedience trained. So yeah. she's like trained nope. to put a leash and collar on, but as you can see, she she just takes me for a walk. Yeah, there's you know? no sit, stay, or whatever. Whereas, of course, we've bred dogs genetically over time from wolves Bye. to have the traits of obedience. <laughs> Time to go back in the crate? Yeah, she says uh, she's time to go under the table, yeah, I she's guess. Yeah, she's done. She's done with this mess. <laughs> she's backstage. Right. 
Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's merits the understanding of somebody like Star versus the, uh, somebody like Fire. Come here, Star. Uh, okay, so good example. She was posing so pretty. I got that far. The end. Um, so um, just back a little bit to the drawing aspect of it. Um, here's my method. You guys are kind of seeing me scribble here like crazy, right? Um, and some of that is based on a sort of overall ability where I've drawn enough dogs uh, over time to be able to knock together something that's roughly anatomically or, or formally correct, right? Um, so the, the use of seeing becomes really important so that you don't always have to look at a photo or you don't always have to look at a live animal, but using the live animal to start that process and kind of like force your eye to, and your wrist to move quickly um, is really important. So note that with the quadrupeds, I'm always starting from the spine. Even if I start with the head, I'm starting with the top of the head or some aspect that creates that gesture that allows me to move through the dynamic uh, element of the whole body, which is the spine. If you start like at the foot, <laughs> um, it's much more difficult to actually build gesture from that. And it's probably going to be incredibly difficult to build accurate proportions and anatomy from that too. So gesture drawing comes from the line of action, right? And with a quadruped, that's the spine always. If we were talking about an alligator, that line of action would be sinuous. And then you'd have those limbs coming off in a different way than they would for an erect animal, right? But the fact is the same that here we have that line of action and then we have the limbs coming off like this, right? Patty, she's beyond. Pay attention to me right now. <laughs> um, so that's where you need to start is always from that line of the spine. If I stopped and I was kind of like, okay, Star's lying down right now, so I'm gonna like block in this head. Okay, forget it, it just went away, right? Like I started to build like a, a 3D form and then the dog got up as though she knew exactly what I was doing, right? Um, so my method, I think, allows you to not be quite so frustrated or constrained by having to learn anatomy and learn form because that can always come very naturally the more you see. The more I look at the dog, the more I understand, you know, like how her cranium sort of is shaped, where her, her ears kind of fit on her head, um, and then like how that line, oh, dog butt, Good. Oh, the dog butt is right there. So good, right? Um, how that line essentially works, and then I have both gesture and accuracy, right? So knowing the basic structure, important. You guys can all see it right there in front of you. But then I say, use your method of gesture work to get used to chasing the animal, right? So that I managed to get that much in there, Oh, here she is again. Like, maybe I'll add a little more or something. Or I'll... <laughs> cute. I'll change direction on her. Um, but, I, but I ain't mad at it if she moves. And I ain't mad at it if I can't get the whole animal in, right? Like, the point is not to do a portfolio piece every time there's a live animal in front of you. The point is to get better at seeing the anatomical forms and the gestures so that your work becomes more and more dynamic through that process, right? And then if you move into 3D, for example, you guys will see um, Alice and Crystal talking about that. Um, it becomes much easier to essentially manage that because gesture drawing like this, just because I'm not building a bunch of spheres to make the form of the animal, doesn't mean I don't see the animal dimensionally, right? And in moving quickly through the form, that's essentially what I'm doing without having to like go like this. See how that does absolutely nothing for the drawing? In fact, it kills it. Whereas, no, nope, that's not how that works. That seems much more naturalistic, and you still see that there's volumetric form in the animal, right? And if I were gonna really take time, I'd come back in, of course, and, and actually start building form through shadowing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so, so 
I think understanding that the animal is not here to serve you, except for Patty, clearly. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, understanding that they're not here to serve you, but instead it's your job to see what you can and get the most that you can out of the experience um, makes it, A, way less frustrating, and B, much more dynamic for whatever aspects of art like are your jam, right? Like if you are a 3D artist, if you are a traditional sculptor, if you are an illustrator, um, you know, then you come back in and you're kind of like, okay, so I get how I could do a base and have it be super quick and super gestural. And I see like the structure at work here. And then I see all these other beautiful elements like Patty, right? Like look at her fur, it's like sick. Like, who doesn't want that on their head, right? Um, and so I'm kind of like, okay, oh, look, I can use that to build form too and still be super gestural. And what I'm also doing is I'm looking at the behavior. And gesture drawing, I think, keeps that front and center as opposed to more structured drawing. So Patty, like, you guys have a different view on her than I do. Obviously, I'm looking at her from behind. But she's doing that dog thing where she's like, eh? right? Because, of course, Molly has all these treats. So her ears the are like. over here. Go over there. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and then she just goes right back over there because right. she knows where they're from. She knows where they're, go over there, right? Yeah, she knows where they're coming from, right? So this like this alertness is something that I'm finding as fast as possible through the gesture. I'm not so worried if the ear isn't perfect or isn't exactly like what I see in front of me. I mean, it's pretty close. Don't get me wrong. I'm looking as hard as I can to make sure that I'm not just like drawing whatever. But you know, you look at Patty and her ear is not shaped like that, right? Her ear is not shaped like that either. So I'm not just defaulting and assuming that that's what the form of the animal is, right? Um, I'm looking and then I'm saying, okay, oh, that line right there, that's sort of what her ear is doing right here. As it's kind of flopped forward because she's looking down and she's got her head at an angle. <laughs> she's making incredible cute face because she knows exactly what to do, right? Oh my God, to die. She's gonna try everything. She, she's gonna down, like pull out I? all the entire <laughs> bag of tricks. Don't roll over though, because that'll get you in trouble. So even what I just did here, right, that's, one tiny part of the animal. And I might leave it at that and move on because even in this tiny little sketch right here, I got a certain amount of alertness. I got a certain amount of structure in here. I know what's the rest of the head, what the rest of the head is supposed to look like. I got that she's like, eh, worried because she may not get a treat if she doesn't act super cute, right? Um, oh my God, it's very difficult to work when she's doing that. So she gets to exercise, yeah. <laughs> it's very difficult to concentrate, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, draw that on there. Okay, right? Cool. Ah. Um, so I might just do that and move on. And, and you guys have seen, like, I kind of make a hot mess, right, on my page. And if I had a traditional no. sketchbook, I would do the same thing. No. And this is something that I tell my students um, to not be precious about what's going down on the page. Again, this is not portfolio work. It's an exercise. It's an exercise in seeing and an exercise in understanding. So if I'm gonna stop right here and move on to something else, great. And also, if I'm going to be like, okay, well, I, I don't really care about these drawings, but I, what I really care about is that I see like that really nice line of the spine right here, and like also the way her fur is kind of lying, oh, that's telling me like where her scapula is, right? Her shoulder blade, I can actually see it in the fur right here. So I'm gonna put that down so that I can get that information because the whole point of doing this kind of work is to build up your mental toolbox, right? Um, it's to use your eye and to use your wrist, like I've said. So making a mess and not being super precious about it, um, I think is really, really important to get over that, um, to, to be confident that it's okay if it looks crap or if you've drawn over yourself, right? Oh my God, dying. Good thing this is being Fly recorded down. because the Smile. cuteness is uncontrollable. Smile. Smile. Good. And then the last thing I'll say is um, I sort of was like 
talk, and then I was going to ask Molly to talk a little bit about, about working with these guys, but um, I, I mentioned this a little bit before, like this idea of alertness, right, where, um, you know, I was looking at, at Patty from behind, or right now, like, I'm, this is Star um, looking down, right? She was, like, looking down, um, so, so that we get that, that sense of, um, you know, especially, like, the working dog, right? Um, wanting to do the right thing or, or like ready for a command essentially um, and using your eye to always be um, aware of emotion and expression right I feel like really great creature design um, and and really great animal drawing it's not design but really great animal drawing um, uses the same considerations that you would if you were drawing a person or designing a character um, very clearly <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't even concentrate. Uh, very clearly, Star is her own individual self, right? And she has her own expression, she has her own patterns, she has her own coloration, all of it, right? So in me looking at her, looking down, I'm drawing this dog making that face because she is super excited to get a treat for being such a good girl, good girl, good girl. And being cognizant of that expression from the jump, will always invest your work. <laughs> you're big, you're big slut about it. Why don't no. you just wait? Why don't you just wait no. your turn? I can't, I just can't. <laughs> um, I'm running always out. being cognizant of that aspect of it, you, it'll be um, natural no, for you. Because. It'll be a part of how your process is, no matter what. And you won't just be drawing some animal from the internet or some animal from your mind unless you are remembering a specific animal, right? Um, and I think that that's really, really, really valid, especially if you are interested in character design, creature design, animation, where like the soul and the spirit of your character um, is paramount, right? Like it really is critical to getting your audience um, absolutely engaged. And you know, like when a dog does what Star just did, where she kind of like hunches and puts her head down a little bit, um, then there's like a little bit of a turn um, and, you know, she, she, she put her, her chin on, on Molly's leg um, and she kind of like bunches her body up a little bit like she's curling into her, like feeling that expression through the whole body and not just the face as well um, is, is something that needs to be natural for you guys as you're drawing, as you're seeing and as you're putting it down. And it's going to take practice. Um, that's just the way it works, but I think it really uh, makes a difference. And so having, like, having people like Molly um, who provide animals for us to be able to learn from, I think is really important. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about like, your specific background in working with animals and how that like, works with your foundation too? Sure, yeah, I, um, I worked at the Los Angeles Zoo for a number of years, about 15 years. And one day I, um, I did a show there called Wild in the City. And it was about animals that are native to this area. And one day the show was canceled. And so the other people who did the show, the other employees and myself had raised all the animals and we were attached to them and everything. So I decided to take them home. So it took me a couple of years to get permits, and I was also an instructor at the uh, Moorpark College Teaching Zoo. I don't know if you've heard of that. That's where most of us, I also went to that school as, as a student, uh, go to school to learn how to work with wild animals and zoos and movie animal training and things. And uh, so we were able to transfer the animals to the Moorpark Zoo and then transfer them to Wild Works. And so this is my, actually, 25th anniversary at Wild Works. So it was a long time ago that I was at the zoo. Um, I still do enjoy going there and seeing all the new um, exhibits that have gone up since that time. And during my career with animals, which is now about 35 years long, um, I've worked with everything you can imagine, at least a little bit and most of them a lot. So uh, you know, I know I've, I've been really, really privileged to not only, you know, learn about all the species in the zoo, you know, from giant animals like ele elephants and, and hippos and things, to having all these animals like mountain lions and foxes in my own backyard. 
So I get to, you get to really know them. You know, you're there with them all night. You hear the sounds they make. You know, you can kind of tell how they feel, what they're doing. So it's it just really been a, a, a tremendous special experience. It couldn't have worked out better. And um, animals are really my best friends. They're uh, not all of them, you know, have big brains like we do, but all of them have superior instincts to ours. So it's amazing how they can see and hear and smell so much better than we can, and they're uh, so alert and so quick. And uh, it, it's just been such a privilege to get to know all of them personally. And it helps me, um, and maybe hopefully you, when you see them, appreciate their habits and their ability to live out in nature, which is kind of going away. You know, that they need this habitat, they're really good at living out there, they're really beautiful, valuable animals. And so um, I hope that in seeing these uh, fox today, that's helped you to learn something about foxes and appreciate them more. So by, by, by going to the zoo, for example, I know people sometimes have like opinions about zoos. Um, the zoo, like our zoo exists to to help those animals. It it doesn't exist to be cruel to those animals. When you pay to go to the zoo, you are supporting preservation and conservation. Um, as an artist, you go to the zoo to be able to draw from life, right? Something that you wouldn't ever be able to see necessarily otherwise, right? Um, so I think it's a really valid exercise. Um, and I, again, we do this with my class as well. Molly comes on campus and, and like I said, brings a bunch, of, a bunch of animals for us to draw, but we also go to the zoo. Um, we draw a bunch of animals from life in various circumstances. And so I would say if building your wrist and building seeing as an artist is important to you, that doing that is, um, is a, a valid and supportive way um, to acknowledge like animal conservation. Um, and when you go to the zoo, um, if you bring a tablet, for example, um, totally awesome. If you are old school and you bring a sketchbook, totally awesome. But what I highly recommend, it's the last thing that I kind of wanted to comment on here. Um, I, I don't know if you guys noticed, but just in doing this little scribble of star, I used my eraser a couple of times to, to knock back um, right here on her mouth, just because her, she's a little bit upside down and it's sort of a tricky angle. I almost never use an eraser. Um, when I'm sketching digitally like this, notice that I didn't use an eraser at all either. Um, using an eraser slows you down and it makes you second guess what you're drawing. So if you are drawing traditionally, whether it's with a pen or a pencil, I don't care. Do not stop, just keep going. If you screw it up, who cares? It's not like there's somebody like me leaning over you yelling that you're a terrible artist or something. There's only going to be the ghost of your like fifth grade art teacher or something. <laughs> and, and she can't hurt you anymore, guys. She can't hurt you anymore. <laughs> or for me, it would be one of my uh, teachers at Art Center telling me that I was terrible and me being like, I'm going to show you. So see, I won. Uh, but, but, but seriously, don't, um, don't, don't erase. You can erase when you are doing your very fine Photoshop render. Um, you can use your uh, control Z, that's great. But keeping your stylus or your pen or your pencil moving forward and being cool with making mistakes, with having to find the accuracy instead of just forcing it into place is going to ultimately make you much better at seeing from life and being able to translate that. That's like my biggest piece of advice, biggest piece of advice I can give. Um, so yeah. I think that's, yeah. that's, pretty much, that's pretty much the jam. Um, thank you, well, as you're always, thank for you. coming. Thank you for bringing the guys. And um, again, we're going to have these guys out uh, back later after we have some uh, presentations, more presentations happening. Um, and you guys will be able to, to do some more sketching. But I think that's basically it for this first part. Hey, thank, you. thank you, everyone. Bye, Patty. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, amazing. <laughs> Best girl, Patty. <laughs> okay, She's like she Noman's unofficial the last mascot. Treat, right? <laughs> you earned that one, right? Cool. All right, guys. Uh, we're just going to kind of get the animals settled uh, and then have Alice come onto the stage. Uh, so just give us a couple of minutes. Great. Good. Thank you.
<laughs> um, so I'm Alice Markham, and I am the owner of Prey Taxidermy. Let me see. Okay. Is it? And how do I go full screen on this? Is that good? All right. So I'm the owner of Prey Taxidermy. I know I look exactly like you thought a taxidermist would look. Um, <laughs> so uh, Prey Taxidermy is in downtown Los Angeles. And basically what I do is uh, a lot of museum taxidermy, a lot of things for nature centers, artists, things like that. Um, no, I'm not going out there and, and killing animals for them to just become taxidermy. Um, that's typically not done anyway. Most of the things I work on are either found dead or they were killed as some type of pest control, something like that. Um, died at aviaries, farms. When you have livestock, you've got dead stock. Um, so how did I start out in this? So I'll give you a little bit of information on that, and then I'm going to go into um, taxidermy process, how it's done, uh, birds, mammals, etc., and then how I've actually been using 3D technology in my work. So I'm taking something, taxidermy, which is about a 400-year-old art, and I'm trying to work now in the bleeding-edge technology, pun intended, um, of 3D. So... Um, I started off at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. Taxidermy is, like I said, it's a 400-year-old art, and it's one of those things that is typically passed down person to person. Uh, this is my taxidermy dad. Um, that is Tim Bovard of the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. Um, he's the head taxidermist there. He's currently the only taxidermist there, so it's a very small department. Um, but I did start out working with him. I started volunteering, and that became an apprenticeship. And then eventually, I think I just showed up every day, and they were too embarrassed not to hire me. Um, so I worked there for a, a number of years. Um, I've been working with Tim about 10 years. And actually, this picture is just from a couple of months ago. I clean up pretty well. Um, <laughs> And so, um, and this was when he and I were working together at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. So it's a great thing for me when I'm kind of like, okay, I have this job, it's 60 pieces, I've been in my job for just under 10 years, um, so it's really nice to have my mentor there that I can be like, hey, I got some mountain lions, I've got sea lions, <laughs> I've got seals, like, you know, I need, I need help. So he's amazing, um, and I, I've been benefiting from that knowledge and passing it on. Um, so a few of the things I got to do early on at the Natural History Museum, got to work on some big stuff. Uh, this is Howdy the Heifer. Um, she's in the Becoming Los Angeles exhibit. And I really found, though, I like doing birds. Birds are um, one of my favorite things to do. They're beautiful. They're delicate. I can do a couple in a day if I've had a lot of coffee. Um, and this is the kind of Victorian artwork I kind of like to do on my own. So you can see, taxidermy can have a few different sides to it. Um, one of the things I like to do is also compete. Believe it or not, there is a world championships of taxidermy. Um, there's also European competitions, um, there's state competitions, and you bring your pieces already done to competition. And I think at the last world show I was at, there were over 700 pieces, so there's, there's quite a lot. I always win best dressed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the birds that I brought to this last competition, uh, this is an African jacana. As you can see, they've got these really long legs for walking on lily pads. And it's actually the male that takes care of the, the eggs and the nest. And so this is, not only is it the taxidermy, but it's showing, it's telling a story. It's like, wow, look at these amazing legs and these long digits, and here's why they have them. We have the lily pad. And then these eggs, I also made the oological replicas look like a, almost like a Jackson Pollock painting, you know? So you're kind of trying to tell a story. Sometimes I get to tell a funny story, 
<laughs> this is a burrowing owl I took to competition. Um, they really like to stand on one leg, and they are also diurnal, right? They're out during the day and the night, and so they kind of stand on one leg and they tilt their head back and forth to try and catch movement, right? That's, that's how their eyes work, because their eyeballs don't move in their head. They have to turn their head. So understanding anatomy is what helps me, and understanding behavior, how it relates to anatomy, is one of the ways in my work it can be accurate. So it's not just what does an animal look like, it's what do they do and why do they do it. So I'm always trying to think in that way. Um, not to toot my own horn, but I did pretty well at competition. I'm currently ranked third in the world. It's only third, you guys, come on. Um, <laughs> here is a photo of the sea lioness we did uh, for the Santa Barbara Museum. She's in her, you know, on a rock. And, uh, you know, it seems relatively simple, but when you're dealing with an animal that's got about an inch and a half thick of fat, um, even the wrinkles, where do the wrinkles go on an animal? So I found myself really looking at photos on Google Images just to figure out, like, all right, if she's got her feet like that and she's turning her head slightly, what do those wrinkles look like? So you're asking yourself, how healthy is the animal? Looking at photos, where are the fat areas? Where are this? Where are that? That's all a part of it. It's not just the muscle and the bone. In fact, I find in taxidermy, the most difficult thing to recreate is the plumpness of the skin. And that's what can really make something look alive. So I like to work on big things. I also like to work on small things. Uh, this is a mom hummingbird, and she's feeding her babies. Um, she is hover feeding. And you can see her little beak is slightly open. And the whole bird is sub suspended by a wire that goes up in through the beak and, and goes down into the baby. So that was a pose I really wanted to do. I knew, I knew that they did hover feeding, but it, hmm? oh, sorry. but it was very, very difficult to find an actual photo of that that existed out there. Um, I ended up finding some, some videos and trying to freeze frame, etc. Again, it's, I get asked very often times to show a characteristic pose that in this case an ornithologist told me existed, but it was so hard to find. So, um, so let's talk about how taxidermy is actually done. Um, so first, you're gonna start with a dead animal. And I'm gonna show you process photos, and you'll have to forgive me. Um, on the photos, we're gonna jump around through a few different specimens, right? I don't always, you know, I'm not always able to take photos of everything, because uh, I'm covered in blood. Um, and the other thing is, uh, these are mostly iPhone photos. A taxidermy studio is not where you want to have a nice camera because it's not going to stay nice. Um, so, but basically, we're going to start with a dead animal. This is a mountain lion. He was hit on the five, young male. I know it always makes me so sad um, to, you know, I love animals. That's why I got into this. Truthfully, I love animals. And it makes me so sad when I come to them and they've died and they've been hit by a car. So for me, I can actually turn that into a positive, this negative. And so, especially when I'm doing something for, edu well, I mean, it's, it's typically all for education in some way, but I know that he can kind of speak for his species and we can start talking about things with him, especially if you know how he died, and to say, hey, you know what, this is why we should legislate for wildlife overpasses or underpasses. And he's actually gonna be used in that regard. So the other thing you're gonna see, um, besides my very stylish scalpel, um, is my measurement sheet. So this is a sheet that um, I got from my mentor at the Natural History Museum. And we use calipers and a, a little ruler, and we take all these different measurements and we measure locked in points. And so what that is basically, the tip of your nose to the front corner of your eye. That measurement won't change, right? Typically speaking, um, 
you know, if I, it, it's, even if I smile, that measurement's not changing. So we measure places like that. Um, other measurements that you might see, so we're using the, the front corner of that eye, and we're measuring to all these different places. And this is going to help me later, because taxidermy is a sculpture. The skin is the only part of the animal on a mammal that is real. All of the rest of the inside is a sculpture. And if I don't know what that sculpture should end up looking like, then what, you know, then kind of where am I going with that, right? It's traveling without a map. So this is creating a, a digital map, or excuse me, not digital, <laughs> very analog map, soon to be digital. Um, another thing that I'll do, in this case, uh, you can see in the back there, that is the skin. This is actually a lynx. Um, it's taken off, the skin is off, so I have just the skull with the muscle. Now the muscle is a bit dried out, and look at that, I don't have any of the fat, nothing. So there's not a lot of data there, right? But I took a mold of that, and then this is a foam blown into that mold. So taxidermy is a lot of molding and casting. I'm gonna jump over those processes a bit, just because that's its own thing. But that is, so that's a replica in the middle, and then on top of that, I have where I've actually sculpted back all those little fat pockets and everything that would have been there, you know, and how do I know what should be there? That's where knowledge of anatomy, that's where all those little measurements and everything that I took, now I can actually build up the nose and I can make that front corner of the nose fit on that measurement. I can do the same to the lips, I can, so I'm sculpting and then I'm looking at that and I'm looking on my phone at photos, et cetera. The other thing you can do is take a death mask and so you can't really do it on animals this furry, but with say the sea lion, I actually took the head and I dipped it in alginate which is a very soft mold making material. It's like when they take a mold of your teeth at the dentist and then pop the head back out, pour in plaster, and now I have a replica of the head. So I do all types of things to get reference. And what's been really drilled into me for my education at the Natural History Museum is reference is key. Because I don't want to make a mountain lion. I want to make that mountain lion. Just like you and me, they're all unique. They are truly unique. Every animal is, even birds. Uh, this is the mountain lion you saw in the first photo. This is a sculpture of um, the face. So this basically is done in clay. We use glass eyes, as you can see. And then this is um, what we call an ear liner. It's a little plastic ear liner that goes up inside the ear. The cartilage is removed on the ears. So if you can imagine your ear, if the cartilage was removed, you would have a little pocket. And that's what goes into there. So everything has to be supported, right, in this sculpture. And you can see all these little wrinkles and all of this stuff. And it will have more detail, um, but this is just the sculpture that we're gonna end up molding to create the final sculpture. So this is just like a process. Um, what about the body? Now there's, in taxidermy, just like any kind of art, there's several different ways you can go about things. Um, this is a Canadian lynx, and so in this, and I was kind of at a basic point with it. They have a lot of hair though, so you're not wanting to do too much detail, but I actually carved this form, and this is in process. I took an actual body, and I was up in Canada, so it was pretty cold, um, so it, it stayed somewhat frozen, and I kind of propped it up, but then I had to imagine, so I wanted to do like a stretching, yawning cat pose, right? Because I have these big front claws. So I had to kind of imagine a little more tension in that spine because this carcass is dead. That's the other thing, I'm basing all of this on a dead animal. If I go with exactly what's there, I'm gonna have a dead looking animal. So again, it's, it's understanding what these animals do. So at the house that I was doing this at in Canada, it was my buddy's shop um, up there. He had a cat. So what do you do? You start scratching, it was a very friendly barn cat. So I start scratching the cat right there on the scapulars and I get that nice roll and I was like, okay, that's the highest point of that rump. So, you know, after a little while of, you know, molesting his cat, <laughs> um, not in a sexual way, um, I, you know, I found out some things. So that's another great point of reference is your own animals. Um, and so this is the sculpture of the mountain lion. 
like I said, we're going to hop in between. Uh, you can see we've got, it's just kind of walking, coming down. And this is actually all made of, so the sculpture you saw, the face, I made a mold of that sculpture uh, in silicone so I could pick up a nice amount of detail. I pour in this stuff called polyurethane foam. And then the body on this is carved. Um, they have a much shorter hair than a Canadian lynx, so I have a lot more detail here. Um, but you can see, I've also got some clay. See around the eyes where all the eyelids and everything? Those are built more in clay. That means um, when I lay the skin over it and I, I kind of tuck around those eyelids, now I can still play with expression, right? Because if my eyes, if like you, I'm going to look at you real mean, that's an expression. Or if I'm scared, like we do all these different things, these nuances. So what is the cat doing? What's the expression? And I, you can play with it with, with the sculpture, but until the actual lids and things are on there, um, you don't want to lock yourself in, you know? I always leave room for myself to be able to play and have fun. Because if I'm not having fun playing with dead animals, how else could I have fun? So, um, and so now back to the Canadian lynx. Uh, I talked about having all the clay on the face and everything. Sometimes I like to work with like a really wet, like a lot of clay, really mushy and things like that, especially with the lynx because they've got a lot of hair. And it's going to cover up, you know, the, the, the slight expression, it won't show. So I have to now think as an artist, right? This is meant to, for people to see. So if it's too, you know, if it, if it doesn't show enough, um, and it just looks a bit static, then kind of what's the point? So, uh, and then you can see I've got the skin being laid over. And a note about the skin. Obviously, this is not a raw skin. If it were raw, it would fall apart. While I've been doing all this other sculpting, uh, the skin has been going through a process called tanning. Um, not, not like here in LA. Um, not, not that I tan. Um, but um, it's a chemical process where we turn raw skin into leather. Leather just like your shoes. Um, the only difference is still the nails are attached, the eyelids, the eyelashes, even that nose and everything is all on there. And so in this case, the skin is kind of coming up and being put on, you know, like a, like a little jumpsuit or something. And it's been skinned up the back we call that a dorsal incision. Um, there are many types of incisions. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Um, there are four ways. Um, and this was my kind of final stretching, yawning, and I really wanted to show off those toes and everything there. Don't look at the tongue. That's what we call a commercial tongue. I like to make my own tongues, but this was up in Canada and I didn't have my favorite pressure pot. So, um, so yeah, and then again, some painting and things like that, but this was kind of put together, blown out with a blow dryer, kind of happy with it, um, so I'll give you an idea. And then let's talk about birds. Um, so this is an art piece that I did uh, with a ceramic artist named Heather Rosamond. She actually is the a ceramic artist over at Art Center. Um, and so this is called a Paradise Tanninger. And you see the beautiful colors and everything it has. Um, so you're starting off with birds. You're starting with a dead bird. And we work on birds typically very wet. And I'll show you in the next photo. This is this bird when it's wet. Where did all those amazing colors go? Um, this is a fun place to talk a little bit about, if you'll indulge me, um, feather structure. A lot of the color that you see on feathers is not caused from actual pigment. It's the way, it's the structure of the feather reflecting light in a way to make that that color, it, it's reflecting the light back and it can make it really jump out. It's really fascinating. And again, just to go back to that, you see how bright that green is and that blue? Well, when you get them wet, it goes away. Not all the way, there is pigment there, but because it's being reflected so severely, it makes it almost seem like a hyper color. I mean, that little head is almost olive then. So, but anyway, I digress. So, um, 
But this is a pretty small bird. It's about yay big. Um, and so initially when I start on birds, uh, this is an albatross, a lot bigger. So again, forgive me, I'm going through specimens. Uh, when I start on birds, we're making a, um, a ventricle incision. I'm opening them down the front. Um, and so on this albatross, um, you can see the yellow right there. And then on the inside, you can see, of course, all the red and the spaghetti, all that. Um, I'm getting rid of the entire um, inside of the bird on the abdomen. That's all going away. The other thing that has to go away is that yellow that I pointed out. All of that is fat. So birds are really interesting because they actually have almost a muscle system, um, and ornithologists are actually calling it a muscle system, within their fat and their skin. Have you ever seen a bird kind of go like that and fluff itself up and it can actually move its feathers. Or you see on some birds they can raise and lower their crest. Those are done by these tiny interconnected fibers that are right there underneath the skin. That would be like you, imagine you've got like little fibers underneath your hair and you could raise it and lower it at will. Um, that's basically what birds have going on. It's really unique. Um, but all those fibers and all that fat they have to be removed because fat turns into oil, which turns into bugs eating it, which turns into Alice crying. Um, and so you can see on this is a pelican wing. This is the inside of a wing. And you see all that little texture right there? That used to be fat, but you can still see all these little lines running through it. Those are like these little wing tendons that exist, and that's part of that. Um, the other thing you'll notice is the bones are still in this wing. So on birds, we leave in some of the bones. We leave in the skull because it has the beak attached. Uh, we leave in the wing bones, but they are very clean. And we leave in the leg bones. Everything is clean, but we leave it in. Why do we leave it in on birds and not mammals? Um, on birds, their bones are very lightweight because they're hollow for flight. So it doesn't affect anything negatively to clean them in, to leave them in as long as you clean them. Um, at the same time, all those feathers are attached to that bone. Now those are the secondary flight feathers and they're actually attached to the bone. Um, on most birds. In a pelican, they actually go into the bone. So if I remove that bone, all of a sudden, those flight feathers don't know where to go. And so that means it's more accurate to leave in the bone and it's not hurting anything. So that's why we leave all that in. Although it has to be very, 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 very clean as I scream at my assistant daily. No, I don't scream at her. Um, I smack her. Um, and so <laughs> this is... Um, uh, a smaller bird, and I'm going to actually have a couple little pass-arounds for you guys in a bit. Um, this is like a European starling without the skin on it. And so this little wrapped, we call this a wrapped body, this technique goes back, I mean, 400 years. This is the oldest technique in taxidermy. It's what we call wrapping bodies. Um, basically, it's wood wool, that little gift basket woody stuff wrapped with string, and you're kind of sculpting as you go. And then we run wires up the legs, alongside the wings, and in the neck, leaving the skull on. And so, to illustrate that a little bit better, um, we've got, you see my little wrapped body over there? And then out the bottom of these feet, do you see the wires there? The leg bones are still there, there's just wires next to them. And you really can't see it, but the wing bones are there and there are wires next to them. So what you end up with, get these things going around, what you end up with is this little articulated, you know, it's basically an armature. So, and then it's all very movable. And that's the fun thing about birds. With mammals, you saw those sculptures. I can't make any changes on the fly. No pun intended. I love animal puns. You're going to have to get used to it. Um, every taxidermist does. I have learned this. So, but with birds, look at this. I can actually change it as I go. I can make them pecking, all of that. One, the skin will be on here. As long as the skin is still wet, you can still manipulate all of this from the outside. So I'm going to start this, if you just want me to pass it around. 
So that's the old technique. And we're going to go into new stuff in a second. Um, and so then, once you get the body in there, and I typically do foam carved bodies on birds now, but you can see where I've put the little body in the bird, and all the little wires are going into the body, and then that gets sewn up. Also, very importantly, you're going to hit them with a blow dryer. A lot of my job is sitting with a little bird on a stand, a blow dryer, and a pair of tweezers, putting every little feather where it needs to be. Um, I, I love that part of my job. That's when I throw on like a podcast and just kind of sit there and rock out. Um, it's very tedious. Uh, if you have obsessive compulsive disorder, it's great to go off your meds and do that. <laughs> My husband loves it when I do that. I'm like, I've got the world championships coming up. I can't be medicated. Clean that, clean that up. <laughs> um, so yeah, just to give you, so here, real quick. So this bird that I'm showing you right here is a white crown sparrow. And let me show you it one hour later. There we go. And that is what comes from sitting there and doing all those little grooming things, all of that. Now, I did this bird a while ago. So one thing that's, I actually do like pointing out my own mistakes. It's better than other people pointing them out. But if you look at the balance on this bird, so I did this bird like maybe, I don't know, six, seven years ago. These legs are too far back. They should be more forward. Wherever that center of that foot is should be the median balance on the bird. And so those are the types of things, especially with any animal, how are they balancing? If this bird were alive and on that perch, it would fall forward. So this also, this owl, it's from a while ago. I think this is like, probably like eight years ago. No, no, probably about five years ago. This is a, a white-faced scops owl. I like him because he's easy and he's portable and everyone loves an owl. Um, so one, th so I'll pass him around. Um, on him, his eyes are not right. They're not the right color. I, I wish I had different ones than back then. I wasn't painting my own eyes. So um, what's great about birds also, which I will be doing with him, I could take him and I could dunk him in a bucket, the skin will rehydrate. The bird skin dries like parchment paper, and it will also rehydrate itself very easily. Just like a paper towel. Get a paper towel wet, let it dry out, and then you can wet it again, and it's pliable again. That's exactly what bird skin is like. So another great thing with birds is I don't have to be sad that, you know, this very rare scops owl from Africa um, and feel like I messed him up because I can just redo him. So do you want to get him going? His name is Albert. Um, and pl please don't run away with him. <laughs> I know he's adorable. Um, so yeah. All right. So that's the, those are the kind of basics of mammal and bird taxidermy. So let me take you through a few use cases of what I've actually been doing with new technologies. So I absolutely love the desert. This is my tent and my shoes. I'm at Jumbo Rocks and Joshua Tree. And um, I was going to basically, like I said about competitions, I was getting the chance to go to the European Taxidermy Championships all the way in Salzburg, Austria. And to me, I would like to take something that they would have never seen before. And I also had been waiting for about eight years, and finally LA County was like, we found a road runner. Again, you, these, are, these are protected animals. I would never go out and collect something you know, in that way. And, but the, one was hit by a car. They tried to save him at a rehab center. He didn't live. And I'd been wanting to do one for eight years. So I'm like, all right, this is what I'm going to take. And so. I looked up some reference. All right, if I got to do any pose, like what would I do? And I found this one, um, and I really liked it. It's a male, he's doing this crazy tail thing. I also like the idea of balance, right? Have him really running. Um, I wanted to modify this pose slightly, um, but with a mix, mix and match it with a couple of other things, but from videos, you know, I felt like this would be a fun dynamic pose. So I isolated that image. And then I worked on a carcass. I made it a little less um, severe on that angle. And so I skinned my Roadrunner. And so on birds, like I told you, um, we we're going to leave in the leg bones, the wing bones, whatever. But I had to do some really unique things for this carcass so that I could freeze it, rig it up, and have it in that pose. So I've got it on a turntable. 
and I um, worked with a company called Kapow. They're out in Santa Monica. They're awesome. Um, and I worked with them. We laser scanned it. And so this way, I'm going to try to capture exactly what that carcass looks like. Now, on a bird, kind of a, I don't need that much detail, really, truly, but I wanted to experiment with this technology. Also, a roadrunner has almost no fat on their body, so if I really wanted to try this with a bird, this would be the one to do it with. So these are our scans. So I didn't need a crazy level of detail, but it's pretty neat to see. And that's it, like, coming at you. And I, I loved that view right away. And what's great about this is now these reference images can be shared with museums, um, other taxidermists, everything. So then this is the 3D printing process. Um, this is one of those UV 3D printers. And I like it because it looks like he's kind of coming out of like a primordial ooze. Um, but you can see the scaffolding and everything that gets cut away. and. Then I got the form, and this is where I just kind of went over it in white, um, so I could, you can really see some of it. And I also added some wires. So on the wires, I drilled into it, and then added the wires. Also on the lower leg here, I had done this deciding to balance off of one toe, so I ended up skinning out those feet and then gluing the skin back over that. And so it's actually a really big wire rod that goes into it. Now, again, this is very experimental. Uh, one of the things that I found in this process was that working with this hard plastic that was somewhat brittle, not ideal. You saw before, I'm working with foam. These are soft, carvable things, all of that. Um, so much easier. So I had things in this, I'm like, oh, if I could do it again, I would do it differently, da 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 da. But, you know, the point was to get through this experiment to see what I could learn. And so this is the skin, you can kind of see. And of course, I've got the, these are acrylic eyes um, here and some clay, right? I need to kind of work that. And then this is it all put together, and I wanted a lizard in his mouth, like he's running with the lizard. And the other fun thing here is they have like this crazy eye makeup on them, on this fleshy area. I actually love powder pigments for that, so I actually used MAC makeup. Um, and I have him here. That's the completed piece, and I'm not going to pass him around. But at the end of it, if you want to come, I know we're going to be taking an intermission, so maybe you can come and pop up and see him. Again, he's balanced off this one toe, and I decided to do this kind of, this is copper ore here, and then this is a copper bar, and it's all about the story of the Mojave Desert. And he's got his little lizard in his mouth and everything. So I had to do the wings a bit differently, because getting them on that, that rigid form was a bit of a problem. Um, <clears throat> Also, I made a, I had printed out a little miniature of what's inside. So you can actually end up seeing that. I snapped one of the legs off. So, whoops. So, but that is, that is there. Actually, I can pass this one around. Do you want to take him? Thank y'all. Yeah, and you can see why that might not be the most ideal material to work with. Um, and so, the next project that I had, um, this was pretty, actually this was the first one I did before the Roadrunner, going a little bit out of order here. Um, but I was contacted by the Getty Research Institute, and they wanted this dog. It didn't exist anymore, they only have photos, but they need a dog to look for this exhibit. It's called uh, Grandfather Pioneers Like Us, and uh, it's currently traveling around the world. I think my dog is in Sweden right now. Um, but the idea was they're recreating this apartment of this artist, and he had this taxidermy dog in it. And it's meant to look antique, and it's not meant to look accurate, whatever. They just wanted something that kind of captured the feeling of this dog. So I said, you know, the feeling of this dog is that the anatomy is way off. <laughs> and they're like, yes, we realize that. I'm like, okay, well, in that case, let me try to recreate as best as I can this dog. And so that's when I started looking up reference photos and wanted to figure out what kind of dog it was. And I kind of figured out it was this kind of black and tan chihuahua type. Um, and the, in the photo, you know, you can see a little bit around the muzzle, you can see some patterning. 
Um, I figured this guy was a pretty good match for it, or this girl in this case. So just trying to figure out what kind of dog it is. And mind you, I don't have that kind of dog. I told them I have no hope of finding that kind of dog. I can't actually sell a dog skin, like I can't buy a dog skin from someone. Like, you know, it'll, it'll have to be something else, probably. And okay, we'll see what we can do. But in the meantime, I'm like, all right, I'll just keep chugging ahead. So I had Kapow do an overlay on that photo to try to see, all right, do an overlay and let's try to kind of at least give me a form to work with. I'm gonna have him pr 3D print a form, like a hollow form, and I'll have something to lay skin over, fine. So I started doing that. It's a little crazy, um, again, but anatomy was not the thing. And so they printed it out. This is um, a low resolution kind of print, which is what I needed for this. I didn't need a high resolution. And then you can see the dog there kind of on my, my little desk there. And I experimented with this. This was not good. <laughs> this was like a, a, a baby goat skin. I was like, I could dye it, I could this, I could that. But you know, all the hair patterns were wrong. Everything was just wrong with it. And so I was like, well, this looks like a horror movie. Let's keep moving. Amazingly, in my bottom of my freezer, as I'm like having, you know, my poor assistant Paloma, um, Going through it, she's like, oh, you have this puppy. And I was like, oh, I forgot I had that. Um, and it was a, a puppy that was uh, part of a litter. It died of parvo. Someone had given it to me. And I'm like, oh. And it was a large breed puppy. And I'm like, well, let's measure it out. And it was pretty close, but it was completely the wrong color. So that can be fixed. So we went to my hairdresser. <laughs> this, this is Liz. And we got some dye and we got some bleach and we made the patterns. And so you can see, I'm, that's that, you know, and it was completely the inverse of what was there. But this dog was a good size. It was a large breed, you know, dog that was a puppy, but we can play with that anatomy. I can make it work. So there he is. <laughs> He's a little bit cuter than maybe the one in the photo, which they were actually fine and, and kind of happy about. They're like, oh good, he's not terrifying. And I was like, he's not terrifying. Um, but the other thing is, it, it was this other dog. So I had to make funny little alterations and I had to kind of meet in the middle of this cute dog versus this form that was a little terrifying. And so then it was a matter of, yeah, there he is. And made the ears kind of weird like the other one. And then I even found an antique harness and bow. I, you know, I made the little bow and everything that it had. And then you can see it there next to the doll and all the scale and everything. I even made a base like they had it and the weird little bell that they had there. And then there it is on exhibit. So it is, it is there. And now it is in London and traveling around. Now again though, you cannot sell uh, federally in the United States cat and dog fur. So he will be coming back to me after the exhibit. He is on loan uh, because of our weird you know, laws that we do have to follow though. Uh, and so next one, I had, and this is where kind of what I learned in the previous two projects, I was actually able to implement a, a lot more. Um, I was given this image by an artist and he wanted to create this woman and she's meant to be holding this rabbit and she's gonna be made all of stainless steel. They're gonna laser cut her out of stainless steel and the rabbit is going to be taxidermied. And I saw this image and I had been to one of these events before, and uh, you know, learned about ZBrush and three, and I was like, wait, what? And so I saw this image, and I was like, this is what I've been messing around with. This is great. Um, they're clearly using ZBrush. Wouldn't it be great if we're going to have this hanging rabbit to use those techniques as well? And like, let's really make it, you know, super accurate. And the other thing is, if they're going to ream this woman out of steel, then this rabbit has to fit like exactly. Um, you know, there's no room for error or any of that. So we actually um, printed out a, a kind of a mannequin of the woman, and you can see her here. So this one is just made out of plastic, 3D printed, all of that. And her hands, everything is going to be like the steel one, fine. And then I had, um, I got two rabbits. Um, from, you know, a friend of mine out in Iowa whose neighbor raises rabbits and was culling some of them great. And you have two that look like exactly alike and they're the same size. Yes, 
Oh, fantastic. So I get these two rabbits, same size, and one of them I take and I kind of string it up like this. We figure out the pose, I work with the artist, I figure out what he wants. And then my plan was to, uh, here's another photo in me taking a photo. Um, and you can see we even put wires next to the limbs, so wherever we put them they would stay. And then I nared all the hair off the rabbit. So we took the hair off because for me, there's no point in scanning the rabbit with the hair. I need the underlying structure. So we nared the hair off, and then we put it back on the form, and you can see here we're scanning it. All the hair is gone, so this is going to give me exactly what should be underneath. So then this is when it's kind of, we we're able then to couple the images, right? So this is our scan from that. And then this is their original scan with ours. And then we were able to actually manipulate it digitally instead of me into the studio. The artist lives in New York, you know, but we could actually then collaborate. Because on this, I'm just the production artist, right? My name isn't on this. So I need to be able to collaborate with my client. So we were able to do that digitally. Uh, and then you can see we really had to figure out, like, okay, what is going to be the attachment on the scruff, and then building it digitally, and then me in the physical world taking those measurements and incorporating it. And then I got very, um, I got smarter than I was on the Roadrunner, and I said, instead of printing the form, why don't we just make a mold? Let's make, let's print the mold. So digitally, and we did it in a little few too many pieces, but ultimately we printed a mold and I was able to pour that foam I talked about into that. And so this is the mold in many pieces and my poor assistant Paloma having to put them together. Um, and so she's actually, um, there we're just taking, again, it's a two-part polyurethane, mix it up, pour it in, and then you have to kind of assemble the pieces. And then you can see from there, there's my final rabbit hanging on the manquette as it should. And uh, I was really pleased with it because we were able to actually show, you know, a lot of that gravity and everything that would be on there. And on the other side of that scruff is like a thumb, and it's hard to see here, but it almost pushes into the fur and all of that. And then another thing we did was make it so the foot pressed down onto the sculpture and they actually put a little dent in the steel. And so I'll show you the final piece is here. And so you can see that little dent on her chest. And she weighs about uh, 2,000 pounds. So yeah, so it was pretty amazing to work on. And so that was a, a really unique way of like scanning the carcass, doing all that carcass casting, because the other way to do that is you know, you take a carcass, you rig it up like I did with the Roadrunner, but then you have to do all this is in fiberglass, and, you know, that stuff is very, you know, it's a carcinogen, it's difficult to work with, or you just laser scan. And so for me, I really think this should revolutionize our industry. And then I'll pass this around. Do you mind? I'll switch you. And you can see a carcass cast of, the, again, that's a different rabbit. Um, and so... Um, bringing it back to Paloma, and then there's my mentor again. Don't mind the gore at the bottom, but one of the things I wanted to mention with you guys is that, you know, this is, um, this is not a dead art. <laughs> um, it deals with the dead, but it's not a dead art. Like, we're always trying to learn, we're always trying new techniques, and we're always working with each other, but I'm actually actively now passing down my skills onto Paloma. And so, just like they've been passed on to me, but it's also about acquiring new skills. So actually, I am waiting for registration day, August 30th, and I'm actually going to be um, taking introduction to ZBrush. So a lot of the issues I had with this, just the way the molds were made, and even on the dog, I would have done some facial stuff there. Um, I really think learning to sculpt digitally could really help my business. And I know it's a super niche thing, but if these objects are meant to be in museums, and you're meant to tell someone, this is what a roadrunner is, this is what a mountain lion is, then I can't think of any more important purpose. I mean, that directly affects education and conservation. So there's a lot of a lot of applications here. I'm sure there's other industries besides my old dusty in industry that could really benefit from it.
So um, if you guys would like, I would be happy to, I think we're going to do a bit of a Q and A. And uh, yeah. Can I answer any questions? I have a mic too, guys, so if you need to talk into it. Oh, cool. Um, hi. Uh, when did you um, discover um, taxidermy, and like, how, did, how were you inspired to go into this art form? A oh, good question. Um, so I actually used to work at Disney um, and started hating all my woodland friends. Um, no, I, I worked at Disney. I actually used to work in social media, media marketing at Disney. And uh, I kind of got very miserable in my job there. It just felt for me, I, you know, it's, it's very bureaucratic there, especially in the department and everything I was in. And it's not what I really wanted to do. I've always had a big interest in science, and I did a lot of sculpture growing up. And so I kind of got to the point there where I was like, you know, just searching for something. So I took my two weeks of vacation, which, you know, you never do, but I did. And I went up to Montana, and I had been collecting taxidermy, and I, I always loved making things, engineering things. I was like, I want to learn how to do this. And so I went for like a, a two week long program and just did mammals and I really loved it. And then I got back down to LA and I was like, great, I can do nothing with this. And uh, yet my husband pointed out to me, he's like, well, it shouldn't, isn't there someone in taxidermy at the museum? Like, could you reach out? Like, you've done some pieces, you've went to school, you have photos of your work, you know, you've got to be the only person in town who's, like, done that. And so I reached out uh, to, I finally figured out, like, his email, who became my mentor, sent him an email, sent him pictures of my stuff, and was like, you know, can I meet with you? So I met with him, I convinced him to let me volunteer, and then I um, would come in in the mornings. He gets there at 6 a.m. to work, because he's crazy. And uh, he's very much a morning person. And I was like, okay, great. I'll show up at 6 a.m. I'll work till 9.30. And then it, I'll go to my job at Disney. And, you know, so I, that's what I did. And um, I got along great with him. And I loved the work. And evidently, he thought I was pretty good at it. And uh, so I quit my job at Disney uh, to work for $15 an hour. <laughs> and it was, uh, I mean, I should have been paying them. Like, that's how great of an experience it was. And so I did that for, I think I worked there like three or four years. And then we completed two exhibits together. And then it was just going to be prep. And I wanted to really branch out and try things. And people kept asking for classes and commissions. And then I opened Pray Taxidermy. So is it good? <laughs> OK. Any other questions? Hi, uh, yeah, here in the back. Uh, I was just curious, uh, with you, recreating uh, these, these animals from the inside out and, and working with their expressions, do you find it challenging not to take that um, too far, I guess, into the uncanny valley of like, this, this animal at this point now looks more human or uh, how do you balance that? Yeah, about expression, it's just so important to get out of your own head. We all have assumptions about what we think certain animals look like and an unfounded uh, assumption is just a guess. And so I try not to be in the business of guessing. So for me, I try to really look at reference. So I'll go ahead and print out reference, and I'll grab a pencil, and I'll draw you know, over it, or I'll trace over it what I really think. Like, if, if I think that that, you know, they'll, even animals do have, like, little eyebrows here, uh, mammals do. And so if I really think it's raised up, find reference with that on there and kind of draw what that kind of shape is, right? What that muscle would be underneath. Draw that, that eye ring, right? The shape of our eyes can really change. The shape of every animal's eye really changes. Draw that out. If I think, if I'm doing a snarling thing, which I try to kind of stay away from, you know, I see all these snarling animals and they have all of these ridges and this and that. It's like, they do not have that many little muscles there. You know, they don't have that many folds there. So you have to really like almost, you have to count them. So I try to base everything on measurements and math and reference. And learning how to read reference is 
one of the hardest things for people. You know, I can really see a big difference in what I thought things looked like before and then what they look like to me now. So reading reference is everything from, you know, if a bird is sitting on a wire, how low is that tail? Right? So does it drop down far or is it almost up touching the wings? You know, it's things like that. So you learn to base things off other things. You know, it's almost good to just draw yourself a little grid on top of an animal you're trying to create or if you guys are sculpting them or whatever, draw a little grid and you'll say to yourself, wow, okay, on my grid, you know, the tail drops down all the way to the, you know, the fourth box on here and the this. And then if you break it down for yourself like that, um, it it's really helps alleviate human error. Because again, you know, it's back to those human assumptions. Like you think like, oh, you know, this, it has little round ears like pandas. Everyone thinks pandas have round little ears, right? If you really look at a panda. Well, if you skin out a panda, they're actually shaped like a heart. And the only way that I know that is my friend Ken Walker went to China and worked on pandas and came back and was like, I took a mold of the ear and look, it's shaped like a heart. Like, you know, so we have, and that's actually, if you really want to make the hair shape look round on that, you have to make that heart dent in the middle. And so it's all, all these things, and it's about sharing, inf sharing information um, and just, like I said, getting out of your own head. So I hope that helps. Any other questions? We have plenty of time, just so you know. Yes? That's a great question. So when posing, you know, what are my angles? Uh, you know, am I making something for one angle? Or, so sometimes uh, I am making something for one angle. We call that the show side, right? Where are viewers going to see it from? And so, all right, that gives me a little bit of a relief, especially, you know, I work on things that are roadkill. So, hey, guess what? It's got road rash all down the right side. Well, that's gonna be facing the wall. You know, in a diorama, you really get that ability to decide what's a show side and what's not. Some pieces, you know, 360 degrees around, which is obviously, you know, more challenging. But even then, you know, with this Roadrunner, I had an intended show side. You know, I got the nice size side of the lizard here, um, creates a nice flow. I've got, you know, the head slightly going this way. And this leg, right, we're being open to the audience. This leg is up so that you can see the full extension of this leg. Whereas if it were, you know, the other way around, it's just a little bit more closed off in my opinion. Although this leg is really kick far back, so it's not that bad. But I, I try to think in those terms. And if you even look like back at my mountain lion, you'll see, you can see the chest of it because it's like that. If I'm like this, you can't see the chest of it. So I do think about those things and I do have like an ideal viewing height. So where do I want the eye line of my mountain lion? Well, if it's gonna be in a museum, which it is, I want little kids to get a good view of it as well and be able to see those eyes. Uh, as much as I want adults to. So, and I'm, I'm pretty short, I'm, bless you. I'm, I'm like five, one and a half. Um, so I try to make that like, the eyes should be a little bit under my eye line. And that I think is, is pretty good for kids. Um, so I'm always thinking about those things and I, I wanna find out, okay, what height is this going at? All of those things, if I have the opportunity. So, and then how can I use those sight lines to educate people best. So if I'm trying to show this particular behavior, um, if it's say like a jumping thing, then, and it's like about to get a bird or something like that, I want both that animal and the bird to be in an interesting place for the viewer. Also, I've gotta hide wires and stuff. So if I've got flying birds, I mean, they're not literally flying, so I'll have them, um, and I'll have a wire go into the wall, but, maybe I'll angle the bird down a little so that if you're at that ideal viewing height, there's no way you can see that wire. And so there's all these little tricks and things that you do like that. Also, um, if it's 
Like I did a jumping bobcat and there were all these like California poppies there. Well, two of those California poppies, the stems are actually wires holding up my bobcat. So you do, it's all these little, it's all smoke and mirrors, right? So, cool. Any other questions? Yes. Teaching process, right? Yeah. And I would like to hear about you, I mean, your own learning process, because your art is amazing. Oh, thank you. Uh, how do you do it? How do you learn from yourself so fast and, you know, like, so I can, as an artist, you know, kind of imitate that or learn from that? Yeah, well, that's the thing. So as a taxidermist, many times your mistakes are on view of the public and behind glass and you can't get rid of them. So, so it's a pretty good idea not to have too much of an ego about it. Just like, you know, if you guys do animations, things like that, stuff you put online, I mean, it's out in the world and you really kind of can't get rid of it. And so what I try to do is, you know, get in front of that and say like, yeah, this is from this many years ago and I used to really think this, but, you know, now I think this and if I can kind of say that to myself that also gives me more hope for the future right if we stop learning then we stop we stop growing and so if I can you know in my own life if I can point out and say well the eyes of this or the balance of this and whatever if I can say that now then I know that something I'm currently struggling with I imagine the future me being like, oh yeah, no, I used to do that, but I figured that out. So that's all a part of, um, for me, that's why I like going to those comp competitions and why I wanted to mention it to you guys. Um, you know, you bring your piece and it gets critiqued and they have a big long score sheet and they talk about anatomy and color and pose and balance and eye set and all these crazy things and then you get a score and then if you want you can meet with the judges and you can talk with, some people argue, <laughs> but you should talk with and like actually get your critique and I think that um, in your own work, you can do that with your peers. You get to do that in school. You get to do that. And just allowing yourself to be open to it um, will really improve your work. I really don't know where I would be if I hadn't started going to competitions and being told, like, yeah, you're doing this, this wrong. And then definitely getting constructive criticism, too. But just being able to hear when I'm wrong um, helps me understand how I can be right. And that's that whole, um, you know, theory you hear coming out of Silicon Valley, which is fa fail fast, right? Make your failures, fail fast, put yourself out there. And so that's, that's what I always preach. And when I see something wrong that my assistant's done or something like that, I'm like, hey, let's talk about this. Like, why did you think that? Okay. Okay, and then sometimes the answer is like, I don't know, I just thought it looked good. And I'm like, okay, well, that's the mistake right there is the way you were thinking. What you did is only a symptom of the way you were thinking. So if what you did is wrong, then you're never really, then you're never really too wrong, right? So that's how I like to think of it. Does that kind of answer it? So just get rid of the ego and just keep learning. And I got to learn from someone who, you know, Tim that I talked about, best mentor ever, amazing, and he works without ego. And this is like this is like the first person I've seen like that, but he works without ego. He's like, he's like, oh yeah, you know, he just did these beautiful lionesses um, that are like nuzzling heads. He put them in a few weeks ago at NHM. And he's like, well, they're not perfect, but you know, I really wanted to show this, and if I had more time, and it's like, you know, and to me they look, I mean, they look, they're amazing. To me they look perfect. But he's like, yeah, on this, like, see this here on this ear. It just, I didn't quite get it, but, you know, whatever. And this is a man who's been doing this for over 50 years. And he's pointing out to me, he's like, this is what I did wrong before he'll let me just appreciate it. And um, it's not that he has low self-esteem. It's that he has um, a high, he's got a high ambitions and low ego. And that's what I strive to be, so. All right, any more questions? Yes? Are really hard for you to work on or even maybe impossible? Uh, what are hard for me to work on? Um, I don't really like working on fish. Fish are typically done as replica pieces. So fish, if you, fish skin, right? Very different than mammal skin, bird skin. Fish are in water. Their skin is meant to exist 
in water. It's not meant to have gravity working on it in the way that it does, right? Um, so for me, with fish, you do a skin mount and um, you have to use a ton of formaldehyde to preserve it. I don't use formaldehyde in my everyday work. It's actually quite green. Um, so for me, I, I don't really like being around that. But if you're not going to go that route, and it's very drying on the skin, and then you have to put tons of paint on it, um, or you can make a mold of the fish, right? And then that's all painted. And that's what we call a replica piece. Many reptiles are done that way, too. That's really its own art. Um, and there's people who all they want to do is fish and reptiles, and they're so amazing at it. I'm less good at painting, and I'm better at sculpting. So for me, what I enjoy is, you know, I think when I'm preening the bird and putting the feathers everywhere, that's really like sculpting. You know, mammals are sculpting, and so that's what I like. Um, so yeah, I would say fish are harder for me, things like that. Anything that needs a lot of painting, um, but even like, you know, um, toucans. I do a fair amount of toucans. Um, their bills, as they dry out, that color goes away. So you've got to completely repaint that bill. And so I'll wipe that out so all the color's gone, use my reference of it before it faded, and then re you know, I airbrush all that, everything like that. Yeah, and then the harder things are just really things with delicate skins. Um, you know, Jack rabbits, brush bunnies, uh, really thin. You know, a rabbit can jump really excited and it can cut its own skin just by jumping really fast. So that's why you never want to scare a rabbit. They can, they can like just slit their skin because it's that thin. Not domestic rabbits, more wild rabbits. Um, doves, pigeons, I hate pigeons. P pigeons are, I mean, in real life, like they're feral and whatever, and they shouldn't be here, fine. Um, in real life, though, um, whatever on pigeons. But when you work on a pigeon, their skin is incredibly delicate, but then there's just a ton of fat on it. And so what I say about pigeons, um, when someone asks me to do one, I'm just like, no, I'm not doing that. It's just like, because when you're done, after all this work, all you have is a pigeon. <laughs> it's a pigeon. Like, it's not exciting. So I don't like those, and I don't like the way pocket gophers smell, because they rot like that, and they're just, they smell horrible. So those are the things I don't like. You'd be amazed, like the sea lion, um, you know, pelicans, uh, any of that, like real fishy and kind of rot, like the albatross, you know, like it doesn't bother me. I'm more bothered by like, like musky things. And, and you should know also animals have little scent glands um, by their anuses. And when you skin them, if you accidentally cut into one, um, like, like on a skunk, right? We, we do skunks and they come in whole and you gotta get rid of those scent glands. Or cats or weasels, if you cut into one, like, okay, get out the fans, it's time to clear the studio. So we're very, very careful when I teach people to skin certain animals. And like mountain lions have huge uh, scent glands by their anus, and if you cut into one, it's like, you know that cat smell? It's like times 100. It's horrible. So, but it will scare away coyotes. So, it's a fun little tip. Uh, we, have, uh, what, we have one question on Twitch here. Um, we have, what kind of paint do you use for taxidermy? Okay, so uh, on paint, everyone, just like in any other art, has their own preference. Um, I stay away from water-based just because I worry about, over time, humidities. Um, paints that I like, I use a lot of acrylic. Um, those tend to work really well, especially if I'm painting over, um, you know, any skins, any fleshy areas or something like that. You can get just a little bit of um, texture with acrylic. And then other people do like um, lacquer paints. Uh, I just think they dry a little bit fast. So mostly I use high flow acrylics when I'm airbrushing though. And then a lot of different things to give wet looks. So sealing it with like a you know, sometimes it's a gloss, sometimes it's a semi-gloss, sometimes it's a matte, or mixing in between there. Um, sometimes I'll even add like a little bit of sand on something to add some texture within that, uh, especially on like little parrot faces where it's all wrinkly and everything. So um, yeah, those are the paints that I like. All right, more questions? Yeah. You said you have to take all the insides out of the animal. What do you do with all of that stuff? 
Okay, so all the organs and everything like that, um, those can, uh, if it's a protected specimen, it has to go back to the biologist, the facility. So all the skeletons, anything like that from a protected specimen, uh, I refreeze it and give it back to the biologist. Here you go, good luck. Um, the other thing, sometimes we'll do uh, beetle cleaning. So uh, dermestid beetle colonies, you can have the beetles, they'll just in a fish tank with some heaters and they'll sit there and eat it away and then those can be used for skeletal articulation uh, or, you know, keep, if you want to keep the skull, you know, keep it for reference, something like that. Um, and if it's really, if it's, let's say it's like just a raccoon, one of the ones that was, you know, a pest control situation, um, those can actually go out. I have, a, um, I work downtown, and actually our trash goes every day but Sunday. So what I do is freeze it and then double bag it, and it can go in our dumpster. And that's absolutely fine. It'll break down. So, yeah, and it'll kind of go back to the earth, if that's what you want to call the dump. So, but yeah, it can go out. Although I did get, we threw out, there was a carcass, and it was like a raccoon or something, and then I don't know if my building manager or someone forgot, she was like, someone found a dog in the dumpster. And I'm just like, no, they didn't. It was a raccoon. So... I'm like, don't you know your animals? The hands are completely different. So, but yeah, I was like, and you have a taxidermist in the building, you know, remember. So. We have another question on Twitch. Sure. Um, what kind of exotic animals have you worked on and what was your favorite one? Oh, good question. So on the exotics, I love exotic birds. Like I mentioned, toucans are fun. I like maybe hornbills a bit better. Uh, you know, they're like an af they're not related at all to toucans. They're actually carnivorous. They're really neat. Um, uh, those were fun. Oh, a penguin. I got to do a, 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 um, a Magellanic penguin. You know, they're like that big. Um, and they're just so, the feathers, you know, and that is feather on them, and you forget that. I mean, they don't plume out, they don't have a lot of structure or anything, but I mean, it's like per square inch. It had to have at least over, over 100 feathers per square inch. And it was so interesting to work on that because the other thing is, you know, they're their anatomy is just so different. And so I had the carcass and everything and making a body for that, but then they had all this fat. So that was, there was figuring out like, all right, how do their feet actually sit? How does this work? And then they had these really fatty feet because they're, they're on their feet all the time. And um, these really fatty little foot pads and all of that, I had to completely, you know, skin the feet out like a mammal. So essentially, it ended up like being a bird that you do like a mammal. Um, so and that's another thing I have coming up, I guess I would say I'm very excited about. I have an ostrich, and um, ostrich, you know, there's ostrich leather, right? The news story going around right now about an uh, uh, ostrich leather jacket, Paul Manafort. Um, so it's, you have to tan it. You have to treat this bird like a mammal but you have to tan it with all the feather on it and all of that. Uh, and then again, the inside, I mean, I'm not gonna be able to articulate and move this, you know, I've gotta really treat it like a mammal. And then the odd thing on them is, you know, there's no skin on their neck or their head. Or excuse me, so there's no feather, their skin. Um, and, but it's got little tufts of things. So you can really see that windpipe. And so that's gonna be an interesting challenge because I will need to paint that to keep that nice pink color. And that windpipe, it's gotta be on the, you know, the correct size. Is that windpipe that you can see from the outside, is it doing the correct thing? And, and I'll tell you right now, the ostrich at the Natural History Museum was done by an outside taxidermist and the windpipe is on the wrong side. So people will notice. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to do that. Um, other things that I will say have coming up that I'm most excited about, and this goes back to, um, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna kind of go full circle here. Um, so I, like I said, I'm gonna be attending uh, Nomen in the fall, and um, basically, 
the big impetus to do that is I have this amazing project. Um, I've done mountain lions before, as you can see, but we have a seven-year-old, um, you know, sadly, she, she passed away. Seven is actually very old for a wild mountain lion. And she was what's called a collared cat. That means that they have data, location data on her. And everywhere she went, all those little camera traps took photos of her. And they occasionally have to trank them. They have to capture them and replace the collar as they grow. So we've got photos from that, we've got measurements from that, we have all this amazing data, we have the whole story of her life, and she's going to be for a wonderful place called Irvine Ranch Conservancy down in Orange County. Orange County feels, uh, you know, according to their, their county, um, some of their county officials, they have different feelings about mountain lions than we here in LA. We're like, yay, P22, Griffith Park mountain lion, we're all excited. They're very afraid of them, and there's just not a great public sentiment for them. So the idea is that she would be a traveling piece where they can see not only her, you know, they could interact maybe digitally with something on the collar, but then I want to be able to show, like, okay, we scanned her. This is what she looks inside. This is this. This is that. And then I actually want to take and scan her when I do her for taxidermy to try to get one of the most m accurate mountain lions that anyone has ever created for a museum. So I want to scan her before we skin her. Then I want to skin her. I'll still take all my measurements, scan the entire carcass, and then I want to take live photos from when she was alive, find that exact expression, and try to mirror uh, marry those images to see how accurate I could get it. And then the idea would be on that expression, to print out little digital death masks so that people could buy those or large donors would get them. And this could all be fundraising for conservation. And so that's the feeling with that. And so I'm very excited. So it would take me like a year and a half. So I don't think it's going to happen soon. <laughs> so yeah. All right, cool. Any All other right, questions? guys, uh, time is actually up. So uh, thank you, Alice, so much for coming thank in. Thank you for having me. That was me. so thank you guys. awesome. Thank you. <laughs>